Welcome, thank you for joining me as we take a look at Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you are just finding me, you've stumbled onto this video. I am Pastor Brian Catherman, I pastor Redeeming Life Church, and we are in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, Redeeming Life Faith family, I realize this is a little weird. It's not an ideal situation, but I want to invite you to think about soldiers in past wars in the foxhole, in the cold, in the dark, with a flashlight and a little pocket Bible, huddled around God's Word, still studying the Word, still submitting themselves to His truth. It's not an ideal situation, and yet they're studying the Word. Or think about Paul and Silas in prison. Acts uh, 16.25 reminds us that they were singing hymns and worship songs. It's not an ideal situation, and yet there they were, worshiping the Lord. Or think about uh, John Calvin and and Martin Luther in the church serving during the time of the Black Plague. Not ideal. Yet there they were, serving those who were dying, even at great risk to themselves. They were, they were being the hands and feet of Jesus. They were serving others as Christ has served us. They were being the church. It's not an ideal situation. And yet there they were, serving all of these. This is not a surprise to God. And no, it's not ideal. And yet we can still study His Word, you're meeting in homes right now, you're breaking bread together and sharing in the Lord's Supper, you're praying together, yeah, hopefully you've sung some songs and worship together, and now we're going to come around the Word of God. And we're going to leverage technology to do that. Not ideal, I get it. In a few weeks we'll all gather back together, we'll be the body of Christ together in person, but for now, we're just going to do this. And if you think it's weird for you watching on a screen, how do you think I feel? I'm preaching to an empty room to a screen. That's okay, that's just what it is. So. Let's go ahead and jump into the Word of God and hope that maybe God would transform us in this maybe less than ideal time. But first, I'd like to pray. God, as we open Your Word, as we look at Your Gospel, as we continue in this series, Lord, we just ask that You'd speak to us. Thank You, God, that Your Word still stands and that You haven't changed. Thank You that we can look at this and be transformed by it, that we can be we can be grown into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, that's what, we, that's what we hope for. And God, I want to pray for all those who are serving others, dealing with uh, illness, coronavirus, and all the things that are going on right now. I, I just pray for all those who are serving in that way. God, I want to pray for our leaders as they're making difficult decisions in these difficult times, that you would give them wisdom. God, I want to pray for all those who are sick, that you would bring healing and safety and comfort. And God, I want to pray that above all, that you would be glorified and made known through all of this. That you would use this to draw men and women to yourself. That it wouldn't just be about a physical ailment or fear, but instead a spiritual ailment that we would see, and that there is no fear when we are resting solidly in you. So it's my prayer, Lord, that you would be seen and glorified in all that, and that you would use this for the advancement of your kingdom, and that we would be faithful in whatever you call us to in this season. And so now, Lord, open up your truth from your word. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and take a look now at uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says this, Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a shriveled hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. He told the man with the shriveled hand, Stand before us. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, or to do evil, to save a life, or to kill? But they were silent. After looking around at them with anger, he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts and told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Immediately the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him how they might kill him. This is God's Word. And what I'd like to do this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're watching this, what I'd like to do with our time is I'd like to discuss some aspects we've just seen in the Sabbath. I have four specifically, but I'd like to look at a little bit more about the Sabbath. Yes, we dealt with that in the previous section of text, um, but I'd like to look at some specifics that are playing out here. I would like to look at this healing and in that, we'll also look a little bit at how Jesus has the authority to heal physically and to cast out demons. I'd like to look at this really weird relationship between the Pharisees and the Herodians. It is significant. It exposes some things in their hard hearts. 
And then I would definitely like to take a look at this hard heart statement that grieved Jesus. Because hard hearts grieve the Lord. Hard hearts, they grieve Christ. And so I think it'd be important that we take a look at that. So let me go ahead and jump in. I have these four things we want to work through. And then after we do that, uh, I think we'll just take a moment. We'll just imagine ourselves in the shoes of, of maybe one of these Pharisees and see if we might see this from, from a perspective we hadn't thought about before. So let's go ahead and look at these four things. First, the Sabbath. And <laughs> I dealt with the Sabbath last week. You can find that sermon on our website in the current series or in the archives, depending on when you're watching this. The, the last part of Mark chapter 2, we talked about what the Bible has to say about the Sabbath, when it is and why it is and what we should do about it and, and how we see Jesus in it. But there are some specific things we need to be very aware of here. The first is that Jesus seems to use the Sabbath to create controversy. And he does it as a teaching point. He does it as a, as a statement of who he is. Uh, last week we saw the disciples were eating on the Sabbath. And they're, they're rolling the, the kernels of the wheat and they're eating and the Pharisees like just freak out. You can see that in Mark chapter 2 verses 23 through 28. And Jesus uses that as a teaching point to say that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In that moment he tied himself to David in a remarkable way, saying the better David is here. He was saying, remember when David ate the, the temple bread, the show bread, the bread of the presence as it's called, which is not lawful to do. And I think he probably did that even on the Sabbath. He says, remember that? And he sort of had the, the Pharisees trapped. Was that sinful or is what I'm doing sinful? Because they're both the same. And so he was tying himself to David, saying the better David is here. And then he told them that he is the creator and the Lord of the Sabbath. Huge statements. This isn't the first time he's caused a controversy on the Sabbath. You remember back in uh, Mark 1, 21 through 28, when there was a demon that came into the synagogue, and Jesus cast out the demon on the Sabbath. And again, freaks everybody out. The religious people freak out in one way. The non-religious people are freaked out because they're like, this could be the Messiah. This could be the one we've been waiting for. He has authority even over the demons. And we're going to talk a little bit more about healing and his casting out the demons in a moment. Um, but I think it's important that we remember that Jesus is Lord and Lord of the Sabbath. He's declaring his deity, and that plays out even in this text now. It's why there's this buildup of the Pharisees. It's why it's just getting worse and worse, and now they're, they're planning and plotting to kill Jesus. He's given them plenty of opportunities to see him for who he is. He, they've still got hard hearts. And so let's just remember that these things that are happening on the Sabbath, this isn't the first event, and it's a controversy for them. So, so Jesus is not running away from that controversy. He's speaking into it. And that's the backdrop of what we're looking at today. So, so that's, that's what's going on with the Sabbath. And if you want to learn more about the Sabbath, go find that other sermon. We, we just look at all the details of, of the Sabbath in that other sermon. Um, let's move to the next one. That's Jesus healing. Now, in this case, he healed a man with a withered hand. But we also see that he's cast out demons on the Sabbath as well. So when we go back to Mark chapter 1, 21 through 28, you see that this demon-possessed man walks into the synagogue. And it's the Sabbath, and they're watching. What is Jesus going to do? Which, that's fair, right? If a, if a demon-possessed man walked into any kind of church service, everyone's going to go, what's about to happen? And Jesus is the one teaching, so everyone looks to him, and what's he going to do? We see there in that moment the demons, uh, they recognize who Jesus is. He's the Holy One of God, and they submit to His authority. So people saw Jesus' authority when Jesus cast out that demon. They said, He even has authority over the demons. Right? And they obey Him. And then many, many in the community just start bringing their, their demon-possessed family members, which is really sad and, and tragic that they have that problem, but it, they bring them to Jesus and He can cast out those demons. You can read more about that in Mark 2, 32 through 34. Now, Jesus is also physically healing people. So we're not just talking about demons now, we're talking about physical ailments and problems. Um, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. That was in Mark 2, 29 through 31. And by the way, that was on the Sabbath. You remember the sun hadn't gone down yet because afterwards the sun had gone down on the Sabbath and then all these people uh, start bringing their, their you know, hordes of sick people and people that cast out demons. So he heals Peter's mother-in-law, again, on the Sabbath. And then he heals all those people that are coming. Again, Mark 2, 32 through 34, you can read about that. And then in 
Mark 2, 39 through 45, there's that guy with no ability to use his arms or his legs. He's a paraplegic. And he's got these four friends, and they're hauling him to Jesus, and they, they rip the top of the roof off because they can't get to Jesus, and they lower the guy down in. And yes, we do indeed see that Jesus heals the man. The man gets up, and he walks, he takes his mat, and he goes. But that happened after Jesus declared that that man's sins were forgiven. You can go back and read in Mark uh, 1, or excuse me, Mark 2, 1 through 12, that the Pharisees freaked out. Who is this who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And yet here's Jesus saying, this man's sins are forgiven. And then Jesus says, look, what's easier, to forgive sins or to heal somebody? And most of us would say we can't do either. And Jesus can do both. So not only did he say his sins were forgiven, he tells a guy to get up and walk, and he does. So Jesus is healing people to show that he is who he says he is, to show that he has the power to forgive sins. He's casting out demons to show that he has authority. Right? The, the physical healings, the casting out of demons, these are to show that Jesus is who he claims he is. And he claims to be God. He claims to be the Messiah. These things serve as a witness to show that Jesus is who he says he is. And now here we go. It's the Sabbath again. And the, People have seen a bunch of these things. These events have got, to be, have got to be like the talk of the town. There's got to be all kinds of things that have just been going on. And now it's a Sabbath once more. And Jesus is looked to to see what is he going to do. What's he going to do? And he, he knows the attitude of these guys. He knows it. And so he tells a guy to, to put his hand out. And he heals him. And yet again, we have a sign. We have a sign of the authority and the power of God. I'm reminded of Exodus 4, 6 through 8, when Moses is instructed to like put his hand inside of his cloak and pull it back out, and it's all leprous and, and gross. And then put his hand back in his cloak and pull it back out, and then it's not. And that sign was so that people would know that Moses was the messenger of God, of the I Am. He was going before Pharaoh, and that was supposed to be proof. And so these signs are supposed to be a proof that the better Moses, Jesus is here with the, with the better signs, the I am, the Emmanuel is here. And then these signs are proving that. I, I think about uh, Naaman, who also had leprosy. You know, he comes to the prophet and, and, uh, in 2 Kings 5, 1 through 19, there's this weird little, like, just go dip in the, in the water. Right? And the purpose of that is to show the power and the magnitude of God and the and the guy named and he's like, well, I could have dipped in lots of water. Why this? Well, because God is who he says he is. God's the one who calls the shots. God has the authority. And that was a sign. We see so many other physical healings in the Old Testament and in the New Testament to prove that God is who he says he is, to show the truth of what he's saying. They're, they're witness statements. And so as Jesus is healing a man, again on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, in front of everybody, we should be alerted to something about Jesus right here. This man is who he says he is. But then you see the weirdest response. You see the Pharisees join forces with their enemy, the Herodians, so that they can plot to kill Jesus. Like that's their reaction. So let's move to this, let's move to this, this next thing. We've looked at the Sabbath, we've looked at the power of the healings and the casting out the demons. Now my third thing is these strange bedfellows, the Pharisees and the Herodians. They, we haven't seen them team up before. In fact, we really haven't seen much about the Herodians at all up to this point. So just really quickly, let me tell you that the Pharisees and then also the Sadducees, they're like religious parties. We have political parties. They had kind of these religious leadership parties and they would, they would vie for like who would be on control of the, of the temple and who had the most authority, and they had a lot of disagreements. One was very conservative, one was very liberal, and they didn't like each other that much. Okay, we actually see some of those disagreements play out uh, in Acts 2, excuse me, Acts 22, 30 through 23, 13. Paul is on trial, and uh, he senses, like, hey, we have Sadducees, we have some Pharisees here, and, and they're, they're trying him, and all of a sudden he just kind of yells out, like, hey, you've got me on trial here because I believe in the resurrection, and the Sadducees don't. Pharisees do, and all of a sudden they just start debating with each other, and they can't even figure out what's going on with Paul because they, they have these, these sort of religious political debate problems going on. And so we know that those guys don't like each other, and even worse for the Pharisees are these Herodians, because the Herodians aren't even spiritual, they're not religious, that, that's not even their zone. They're wealthy, and they like uh, Herod, who's, who's the area governor or leader, 
that the Romans have put in place, and they like the Roman policy. So these are like aristocrats that are just political, influential, rich, powerful people. And there is no reason I can think of why the Pharisees and the Herodians would be friends because they were enemies, unless both of them had a greater enemy. So it would seem to me that if the two enemies would join forces, there must be public enemy number one, Jesus Christ, that they both want to take out. And that's what it says. It says they want to plot to kill him. It shows you how much they must hate him. And we see how their, their plan plays out. You actually see it again. You can, you can read about this on your own in Mark 12, 13 through 17. We're going to get there in our series as we're going through the book of Mark. We'll get there someday. What happens is it says the Herodians and the Pharisees, they come back together uh, to question Jesus. And they have this question, and it's a political question. It's about taxes. Is it right for people to give taxes to Caesar, uh, this oppressive government? Is that right, or should we not give taxes? And you might remember Jesus takes a coin, render under Caesar, you know, what's his, but what is God's? Give to God. That's, we're going to get there. We're going to talk about that in more detail. That's the Herodians and the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus so they can have him executed. Okay, that's what's going on. It shows us just how hard the hearts are of these Pharisees, how far they are from seeing who Jesus is. You know, if, they, if they're going to favor these, these political people over even the one claiming to be the Messiah they're looking for, there is a real problem. See, to them, Jesus' message, his truth, and these signs, they make him their most hated enemy. Public enemy number one. You wouldn't think that of these people who profess to be people of God, and yet they just aren't seeing it. I mean, let's take a look here. Uh, before we get into this hardness of heart, our fourth item, let's look at their response, their attitude to what Jesus is kind of calling them out in. So if you look at... Um, Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus has just questioned them. Hey, what's good? To do good or to not do good? Should we do this on the Sabbath or not do this on the Sabbath? And verse 5 says, After looking around at them with anger, he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And he told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Immediately the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him how they might kill him. They were that angry. Their hearts were so hard, they were just unwilling to see any of this as possibly of God. They were unwilling to see who Jesus was or who he claimed to be. Their ways were what they wanted to be Lord. Their rules needed to be Lord for them. That's what they wanted. That's what their hard heart wanted. So now let's go ahead and shift gears here to this hard heart. What is this hardness of heart? Well, for them, it seems like they were so concerned about the rules so concerned about their power, so concerned about their position, that they were completely unconcerned about this man's suffering, the man with the shriveled hand. They had no compassion for him. They didn't seem to care at all. Zero. I wonder if they ever did anything to help alleviate this guy's suffering, or anybody's suffering for that matter. And yet Jesus is showing compassion. They have no compassion. They have none. Their heart is hard to those around them, the, the least of these around them that are struggling. That's a hard heart. We also see some circumstances in our Bible of hard hearts. There's, a, there's an entire study you could do of this hardening and softening and hard hearts and even more importantly new hearts. And so in Exodus 7, 13, uh, there's many other references right there in Exodus. You see this, this confrontation between God's messenger Moses and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's heart is hard. You see Pharaoh's heart is hardened by God. Often. And he does that. People go, why would he do that? Well, that's to ensure, God is doing that to ensure that God's glory would be seen by the nations, not just then, but for every generation to come since then. We are still talking about that. Because God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh worked against all of that so God's glory could be shown. We see in, um, we see in Psalm 119.70, God is condemning the arrogant, those who think they've got it all figured out. And he says, their hearts are hard and insensitive, but I delight in your instruction. I think our Pharisees seem like they have these same insensitive hearts, not delighting in God's instruction for caring for others, but instead they have hard hearts. In Matthew 13, verses 10 through 17, Jesus explains why he uses parables to teach. It's 
It's an odd, why, why are you teaching with these, these parables rather than just saying as plainly as you could and just teaching plainly? And so in, in Matthew 13, Jesus quotes Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. that says, You will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. For people's heart has grown for this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn back, and I would heal them, says the Lord. That's how Jesus sees his teaching with the parables, that, that there's just hard hearts. So he's speaking to those who don't have the hard hearts, the hard ears, the hard eyes, the blind ears, the blind eyes. In Matthew 19.10, and then we also see it in uh, Mark 10.5, so we'll get to this in our series as well. Uh, Jesus tells the people, they're asking about divorce. Is it lawful to get divorced? And we ask that question today. I get qu that question all the time. Can I, is it okay if I get divorced? There's no okay in divorce. What you're asking is, is this sin, after a long line of sins, okay? And what Jesus actually said to them was that Moses offered a certificate of divorce. He made a way and out for people because of, it says, their hard hearts. They were already rebellious. They were already not submitting to his instructions. So he made this, this sort of provision in Moses' day. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19 says that people who do not seek God, people who are not living a godly life, are doing this because their hearts are hard. It's because of their hard heart that they don't seek God, that they reject God, that they rebel against Him, they want to have nothing to do with Him. They've got this hard heart. And then you see so many times in the New Testament, places in the Old Testament, and you especially see this repeatedly in the book of Hebrews, a quote that comes from Psalm 95.7. It says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Clearly, the Pharisees did not hear the voice of the shepherd. Jesus, who says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. That's in John 10. The voice of God's disciples is people. They hear his voice and they follow. Those who don't hear, don't follow. His disciples hear his voice and follow because we see that same call today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. So that's what we're seeing about this hard heart. We see a little bit later that God actually gives a new heart. We see that in uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. This is what we see in this text. We see this controversy, and we see this Sabbath issue, and we see healing, and we see God's power, and we're reminded of Him casting out demons and showing power, because that happens on the Sabbath. We're reminding Him of healing other people. We're reminding Him that He, we're reminded that He's the Lord of the Sabbath, that He is who He says He is, and we're called upon these moments where we see this witness to respond appropriately if we hear, to not harden our hearts, and instead to submit to God, and yet... And yet, the Pharisees plotted with the Herodians against Jesus so that they could kill him. That's what we have in front of us. Now, I want to take, I want to take a minute here. I'm just wondering. Let's just sort of have a little thought exercise. Let's, let's, um, let's just imagine. Now, this is not in the text. This is just to help us think about this a little bit. Let's imagine that there's the group of the Pharisees. And what if, what if one of them while this was going on, you know, there in the Pharisees' posse, just started to hear that little whisper from Jesus. His heart was maybe being softened. Imagine that for a moment. What, what, would, uh, what would happen to that guy? I have to think, I have to think that maybe he would be ostracized from the rest of the Pharisees. If these guys are so angry at Jesus, that they're willing to kill Jesus, if he were to say, hey, hey guys, wait, hold on a second. Maybe we ought to hear him out. What do you think the Pharisees are going to do? Man, they're not going to take it. They are not going to have anybody saying, let's just hear what Jesus has to say. Let's just, let's just hear it out. They're not going to allow it. If they're willing to kill Jesus, of course they're willing to kill that guy or, or kick him out. Maybe they'd say, look, nobody can have anything to do with that guy anymore. He is questioning what Jesus is saying, and he might be hearing 
from the Lord, he might be wanting to explore that maybe Jesus is who he claims he is, rather than us telling Jesus who he is. Like, maybe, maybe we should never talk to that guy again because he's just questioning. He has doubts. He wants to explore God's word for what it might say. Okay, Pharisee guys, never talk to that guy again. So now all of his friends, all of his, all of his sphere of influence just kicks him out, right? He's kicked out, he's ostracized, he's shunned, maybe he's killed, maybe he's threatened, maybe there are problems. And it's not just the problems that he's going to have from the outside, right? I mean, he's going to have those problems, sure. But how about the problems he have from the inside, like the dialogue in his mind? The things that are playing out as he's thinking about it, like, if I believe the Pharisees, but the Pharisees are wrong here, how can I trust anything I know? I mean, can I trust this Jesus? Because I can't seem to trust this thing that's happening over here. Or maybe he's thinking like, as his heart is softening, he's starting to go, hey, maybe Jesus is who he says he is. Maybe he's afraid of being embarrassed. Maybe he's been this staunchy Pharisee his whole life. He's dedicated just hours and hours and hours of reading and memorizing scripture and knowing the law and serving and you know, long prayers in the streets and all these things that he's just dedicated himself to. And what if he was wrong? What if his group that's saying, we reject this Jesus. We don't want to hear from this Jesus. What if that group is wrong? How does that, like, is he going to be, he's got to go back to his family and be like, you know what, I think I might have been wrong here. What are people going to say? How's this going to work? I, I heard this podcast not that long ago with a, a woman named Rosaria Butterfield. The podcast was from Nine Marks and a guy named Mark Dever. Uh, interviewing this woman, her name's Rosaria Butterfield, and she was a professor at this at this uh, liberal arts school, very liberal school. She was the um, uh, I don't know if it's like uh, I think she said it's queer theory. She was the LGBTQ activist, not only on campus but nationally. She was speaking out. She was very vocal about these things, and she mocked the Bible. She mocked Christians. She did not believe that uh, any of this could have been true. It's very similar to another person that I had spoke to uh, personally and met, um, Beckett Cook, similar type situation, right? And, and then something happened to Rosaria, and the same thing happened to Beckett. Started feeling this thing from God, starting seeing truth, eyes starting to be open, this, this blindness suddenly not blind, ears open, heart softening, a little whisper, psst, hey, psst, hey, soften up, hey, think about this, what about the, here's truth. You're living over here, but here's something else. And for uh, Rosaria Butterfield, it took her a long time. She started working through God's Word. I think she said she read the Bible three or four times with a Christian. Just uh, still hadn't really, she's trying to understand it. Trying to think through what happens. Everything I am, all of my identity, all of me has to die if Jesus is who He says He is, and then I have to give myself to Him. She's processing through all of that, and as she did that, as she finally made a profession of faith to say, I'm all in with Jesus, I die to self, I follow Him, which is also what we symbolize in baptism. When that happened, her community rejected her. The school couldn't have her now teaching what she was teaching. Everything that she was, all of that previous identity, everything she had built was no more. That's hard. That's difficult. All of her friends suddenly ostracizing and, and shunning her. I'm seeing some of the people that are connected with uh, Becca Cook doing the same thing on social media. It's hard. It's sad. These people, are, they're, they're weighing the cost. They're counting the cost. They're thinking about what it means to go all in with Jesus, and the cost is heavy. But let me ask you this. What is better, to know God and to have Him and to enjoy Him forever or to have the world's false community and false identity for the short, fleeting moment before we stand before God in judgment? What's better? What's better? Now, the Pharisees reply is like, whoa, hold on a second, it's not like that for me. I've been serving, I've been doing all these things in the name of God. I'm a Pharisee for crying out loud. Like, I'm automatically religious, it's just cooked right into the name, right? It's not going to be like that for me. But Jesus has something to say about that. So whether it's, whether it's real far from God or something that looks like it's godly, but it's really religious, Jesus has something to say. If you still have your Bible open, if you're still tracking along with me, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 7. 
Let's look at verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Jesus is preaching the sermon, and he says this to the people. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, or do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. The will that we are to do of the Father is to know Jesus, to surrender our lives to Him, to follow Him, to be that sheep that hears His voice. That's the will of the Father. And so it doesn't matter if you have prophecy in His name or uh, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching some message in His name but you don't know Him. You're casting out demons in His name but you don't have a personal relationship with Him. It seems like that would be the Pharisees. They want to kill Him. Right? The Pharisees want to kill Jesus, so clearly they don't know Him. Clearly they don't have a relationship with Him. So this Pharisee, he might not be in good shape. He might have a problem. He might hear, I never knew you. No personal relationship. That's scary. Now, we hear this and we say, what do we do? What if that's us? What if that's us? What do we do with something like that? When we hear that from Jesus, that maybe we think we're believers, we think we're Christian, we're doing things in Jesus' name, but we don't know Him, we're not submitted to Him, we might be more like the Pharisees than like His disciples, what do we do? He gives us some instruction if we just continue reading. So verse 24 says, Therefore, okay, because of this, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine, there it is again, that hearing, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the rivers rose, and the wind blew and pounded the house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. This is a contrast. Jesus is that rock, this foundation of truth, versus built on the quicksand of lies. Jesus is saying if, if you're building on the quicksand of lies that just doing something in Jesus' name and working in this way and you know putting, putting Jesus' jersey on and putting His name on you but you don't know Him, you're not hearing His voice, you're not following Him, you're just building your hope on lies. And when the things get tough, it's gone. Jesus says build on His foundation so that you don't hear, I never knew you. Instead it's die to self, live for Christ. Today, if you hear His voice, maybe there are some watching this video, you're, you're maybe like the Pharisees. Or maybe you're like Rosaria Butterfield, and, and uh, you're just working through this and you're starting to hear this whisper. Maybe a little doubt. Maybe the foundation of sand you've built on is starting to to slip and slide. Maybe you're starting to be afraid that when you die and stand before the Lord, you might hear, depart from me, I never knew you. If you're hearing the Good Shepherd, if you hear His voice today, do not harden your heart. I beg you, if you're hearing His voice, do not harden your heart. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean if I'm hearing His voice? Let me get really practical for a moment. You might not be hearing an actual voice. Most don't. But maybe you're drawn to something here. You're drawn to this truth. Or maybe you're experiencing doubt in your, your worldview that you have trusted in so much. There's something going on. You know it. You, you, you feel like God is drawing me in some way. Okay? Like, you're not actually hearing something, but you know He's drawing you. You know the Good Shepherd is there. He's, he's, he's calling you. He's beckoning you. Okay, what do you do about that? When you're compelled, when you're, when you're hearing this and going, okay, i got to look into this more, that is God drawing your heart. And that is God drawing your mind to Himself. Is God drawing you? Is this you? 
Am I describing you? Are you feeling this? Okay, that's you hearing God. He's calling you. If you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Don't push Him away. Don't plot to kill Him. Don't side with other enemies in order to push away Jesus and to, to kill Him. Okay? If you want to talk about what the Bible says it means to have a relationship, to know Jesus as a friend, as He says you can, to walk with Him, to follow Him, to die to yourself and live in Christ, to be resurrected, to hear instead, not, depart from me, I never knew you, but well done, good and faithful servant. Like, reach out to us. If you're watching the video and there's a way to make comments, comment there. If you want to get in touch with Redeeming Life, find us on the web. Reach out to me. There's a comment box. We want to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Or if you know a Christian, or if you have a Bible, open it up. You version Bible app. You know, read the book of John. Read the book of Mark. All of our sermons are online. Listen to sermons. We want to do anything we possibly can. I'm begging you, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Eternity depends on it. It depends on it. Build your house on the rock. Romans 10 says that if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you're letting Him call all the shots. You're saying, I'm not in charge of my life. Jesus is in charge of my life. I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to walk in His steps, not my own steps. I'm going to build His kingdom, not my own kingdom. I'm going to build my house on the rock. It says you'll be saved. He'll draw you to Himself. And then John 1 and I would encourage you to read verses 1 through 18. It says that for all those who see that He is who He says He is, who Jesus claims to be, right, you hear that voice, you don't harden your heart, you follow Him, it says He gives you the right to become a child of God. You're born as a creation of God. But those who submit to Jesus Christ, say, not my way, I'm a sinner, Jesus' way, His death, burial, resurrection, His sacrifice on the cross, those who submit to Jesus' truth, are adopted into God's family. They get to be a child of God. If you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Most of you hearing this, participating in this video, or listening to this sermon, you're in His flock. You know, you, most of you are probably part of Redeeming Life Church. Most of you are friends of Jesus. You know Him on a personal level. You're a child of God. You're part of His flock. You hear His voice on a regular basis and you follow Him. You're a disciple. That's where most of you are. right? Your heart is not hard. You've been given a new heart, like it says in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. You've been given a new heart. The heart of stone is gone and the heart of flesh is in you, like it says in Ezekiel 36, 26. It says that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. That's you. Okay, so for, for us... For you, for us, for, for those of us who are children of God, what do we do with a text like what we've just read in Mark? What do we do with Mark 3, 1 through 6? I'm going to propose to us that this should compel us. This should move us. It should stir our hearts and our minds to see the glory and the wonder and the protection and the saving power of Jesus Christ. We should celebrate His healing power. He, he's a healer. We should celebrate that He's Savior. We should celebrate that He's sovereign. All that's crazy in the world. He has got it all. He saw it all. He's Lord of it all. We should celebrate that. We should rest in it. We should find our joy in it. We should find our hope in it. We should worship Christ because of it. Because of what He's done. We should see that and go, oh Jesus, to You. You get all the glory. And then I think I think we should join Jesus in the good that He does. Even if it's on the Sabbath, even if it causes a little controversy. I think we need to join Jesus in what He's doing as we walk with Him. Okay, to, Today presents us with all these great many opportunities. We have so many opportunities to proclaim His truth, to be His witness, to show people in a very fearful, you know, panicking world where they can find hope. We have an opportunity to serve people, maybe even at the risk of our own lives, like Christians who've come before us have done. We can serve our neighbors and love our neighbors as Christ has loved us and proclaim His hope and His truth. What is Jesus calling you to do in light of what He has done for us, in light of His glory, in light of this amazing thing that He has done? If we're like the man with the withered hand and we're healed, what do we do with that? We tell the world. That's you and that's me. If we, 
If we hear His voice, that's what we do. That's what we do. I believe Jesus is calling us, Redeeming Life Church, to join Him. So today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Instead, turn your heart to Christ and rest in Him. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, thank you for our opportunity to gather, even if it's via technology and not even all at the same time. God, I pray that you're speaking to us from your word and you're moving us and compelling us, that we see how magnificent you are and we worship you because of it. Give us opportunities to serve and to proclaim your hope and your truth and your word. Lord, give us the courage to be faithful in that as we have those opportunities. Lord, we want to pray for all those who are struggling and afraid. And God, I pray that we'd be able to gather together again as your church. And when we do that, we'd all be there. None would be lost to any of these scary things. Maybe we'd have even more. God, it's my prayer that we long for that moment as we see our brothers and sisters in, in Christ together in worship. And God, above all, I pray that we would long for eternity when there will be no more fear, no more pain, no more tears, and we will be with you in your rest and your joy. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Even if this format's a little bit different, I hope that God's Word has blessed you today.